Okay, so we are going to get started. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're Zooming from. My name is Peaches Valdez and I am the Dean of Admission at, here at Hamilton. And I am so happy to have you all join us um, today uh, for this session inside the classroom with Professor Lehman. Um, I also wanna congratulate you all on your admission to Hamilton's class of 2025. Um, we hope that you'll start coming to some of these events, learning more about us, but also we hope that you'll call Hamilton your home um, very soon, so. Um, it is my pleasure, as I said, to have you all here, but also to thank Professor Lehman for joining us this evening. In addition to his role as a faculty member, and it's definitely a busy time in the semester, he also has a number of responsibilities on campus within, within the county as well. Um, so the next best thing to visiting a class is to be able to connect with a professor who loves being in the lab, working with students, helping students kind of find their passion. Um, so Professor Lehman has joined us this evening and he's going to be talking to us about the academic experience, but also some of the work that he's been doing. And he definitely should know about the Hamilton community as he's been here for over two decades. Um, in addition to being a professor in the biology department, uh, Professor Lehman um, is a member of this year's um, COVID task force for the college, but he also serves um, with the county public health office in doing contact tracing, but also setting up public health guidelines. Uh, but more importantly, as I said, he's a professor. He enjoys working with students, and we're going to get to hear a lot of, um, of that classroom experience and what has um, kept him here for over 20 years. Um, so Professor Lehman, Herm, you're on location, and where are you Zooming from? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, the introduction and the opportunity to teach, or to teach, I just slipped right into that, um, to talk with um, the class of 2025. Is this who I'm speaking to? Oh my gosh, time flies when you have fun. Um, so I am in my research lab and I consider this to be my favorite space to be on campus. I consider it to be our, our best teaching environment. Um, and I, I hope to articulate some of those ideas um, and just sort of walk you through why I'm here and why I do what I do. Um, and to begin, um, my path to Hamilton College has not been a straight one. I started as a marine biologist from the University of West Florida. And I started looking at sea critters and I've just always been interested in vertebrates. And I heard a talk by a professor from the University of, well, Florida State University, and I was just fascinated. I was interested in behavior, but he came and gave a talk on neuropeptides, these small molecules that are in the nervous system that affect all these organs. And I became fascinated and wanted to work on this project. And so I quickly became a biochemist, became a graduate student at Florida State University, went on to get my PhD, isolating neuropeptides and sequencing some, I became a biochemist. And my academic career has led me down a path that I never quite would have imagined. Um, but I've always stayed true to invertebrates. So I wanna walk you through the lab and, and give you a little bit of insight as to what I research. But the other thing I wanna tell you about is that I think about my research informs my teaching and then my teaching informs my research. So those two things go hand in hand. And I would say, I'm certainly not alone in Hamilton with respect to that. I teach to my level of expertise. And one of the reasons that I came to Hamilton College was that I could teach the courses that I wanna teach. Um, I love teaching intro bio. I, I love seeing first year students and second year students in a bio class. And we go out and I ask them to pick a critter up out of the field and they can't choose a vertebrate. They have to follow my passion with invertebrates. And then they have to find a behavior. And then we dive into the neuronal mechanisms. And this is all at an introductory level. I also teach a cellular neurobiology class where we dive into the molecular and cellular details of nervous system function. And we're right in the middle of that. I teach that in the spring semester. And we go in a much more molecular direction. So you start to see what's happening in, in my world as I start with behavior. And I've always been fascinated with that. Neuropeptides coordinating behavior, but those experiments um, that I did long ago have led me to my current interest. And so let me just first walk around the lab and show you what a laboratory looks like at Hamilton College. And the first thing you'll notice 
is that I have perhaps the best view on campus out my laboratory view. I think you can see the lacrosse players playing lacrosse. So if I get bored at the bench, I simply can look <laughs> out and watch any game. And it's especially useful when the weather turns cold in the early spring. And I can sit in my nice heated office and watch sporting events. <laughs> so the first part of the lab is sort of our molecular wing. And I think it's a small space. It's not a huge laboratory, but we fit a lot of people in here. So the kinds of tools that I use are things that I have developed since I've left graduate school. I became very proficient in amino acid sequencing, um, but had to learn molecular biology because DNA swept the field. So now a big piece of what we do in the lab is molecular biology. But then you, you ask a question and you don't have the tools, so you have to develop those tools. So we actually do quite a bit of histology. And this is a microtome where we cut sections of fly brains. Um, I'll show you flies in a second, but we're interested in neuronal mechanisms of injury. And I'll explain that. And this is an empty bench. It, it's not often this way. And most of the students have left. Things usually slow down here at five and pick up in the evenings. But this is our molecular bench. We keep it clean because we work with a lot of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is relatively um, labile. And um, then we get over to our sort of our, our processing bench and we do histology here. So we stain the sections. Over here is our dissection bench. So we have microscopes. Our fly stocks are up here. And oh, we've got a, a little experiment going here. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then our hood, which is jam packed with a, a vacuum oven for a wax and things like that. So what I would say is that we have a lot of instrumentation in here that drives our interest, but oftentimes what we have to do is create our own tools. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let me start with um, one project that I find particularly interesting and that is the growth and development of a, a caterpillar. So I'll bet you, all of you guys have seen a caterpillar before. Something like, let me see if I can, there we go. So this is a three day old Manduca sexta. So Manduca sexta is a tobacco hornworm. Any of you have ever grown tomatoes before? Um, you'll see this animal eat the tomato leaves. And in fact, this animal grows so fast. So this is about a three day old animal. And then, this animal is about a week old. So in a week he's grown about from 0.1 grams to one or two grams. And then, in two weeks time. So this animal is two weeks old and this is about a 10 gram animal. So over the course of two weeks, this animal has gone from a 10th of a gram that would fit on your fingernail to as big as my thumb, just about, eh, just about. And I've been working on a neurotransmitter in these animals called octopamine. And octopamine is like um, norepinephrine in your body. And you may not know it, but you need vitamin C to make norepinephrine. So I had this simplistic idea. I wanted, to, I wanted to understand what octopamine did. So I thought, well, if we just took away vitamin C, we'd get rid of, we'd get rid of the octopamine. And what happened was is that, and so we just watched the animals. We just watched the behavior. And that behavior turned out to be fascinating because these animals simply did not grow. We simply took um, vitamin C out of their diet and they stayed about the same size as that one day old animal for 40 days. We could keep them alive and it took a lot of coaxing and feeding, but we got that um, going. So that led me to believe, okay, so all we did was take vitamin C away. Why are they not growing? And that turns out to be a fascinating question. And I think <clears throat> through doing cellular respiration studies, glucose studies, glucose transport studies, and a little bit of morphology, I think what we've discovered is that 
um, collagen that requires vitamin C is compromised in the fat body. And, and the fat body is kind of like your liver. So it receives nutrient information and sends a signal to the brain to release insulin and growth hormones. We think that that nutrient sensor in the fat body is disturbed. So started off as a simple little experiment but I think what we've done is unravel the mechanisms by which, or, or starting to unravel the mechanisms of how cells sense glucose. And of course your body has that and it's done by the liver. So the other thing that I do in the classroom and the lab is I, I come at life from an invertebrate perspective, but I always want to know how that connects to how we operate. And so we have a nutrient sensor. We don't know much about how nutrient sensors work. So here's an opportunity for this little guy, and yes, he's alive, okay? Uh, we gotta nudge him along. There, he's wiggling around. And there you go. And actually a little bit of, uh, I'll get off this, I'll get off on, on wild tangents here too quickly, okay? Um, so that's one project that we have going on. Um, the other projects, and I actually have four sort of active projects going on. Um, the other project relates to octopamine in a different way. And what we found was that <clears throat> this animal was, um, had two different variations of an enzyme that synthesizes octopamine. And I found that puzzling because I'd never seen that before in any other genomic search. And so I started digging in and what we found was a novel gene that coded for a novel protein. It looked a lot like the enzyme that makes octopamine, but a little bit different. So we have started then, okay, so you, you find this protein, how do you start to discover what its function is? You look for where it is and when it is. And it had a completely different distribution than what we saw with the neurotransmitter synthetic enzyme. But what we noticed that it was very interesting is that it was always associated with emerging cells. So in the oocytes, in the eggs of a female, this is abundantly expressed. If you look at the first born embryos, they start to express a nervous system in about 18 hours. This gene that codes the proteins found there where the neurotransmitter synthetic enzymes are there. So, and we've also discovered it in retina, developing retina. And what we have come to the, we've come to the hypothesis that this is associated with hypoxic zones. And that is a lack of oxygen. So as cells start to proliferate, they outstrip the body's ability to grow in blood supply or in trachea in an insect. And so I think what we are looking at here is some natural way to resist hypoxia states, low oxygen concentrations. And of course that's interesting from a, a cancer perspective because that's exactly what cancer does is cancer grows faster than the blood supply can provide it. And there's lots of different mechanisms that compensate for that. I think we have a little bit of piece of the puzzle that we've worked out in Drosophila. And speaking of Drosophila, um, perhaps one of the goofiest experiments that I've ever done is this came about through a collaboration, actually just a conversation with one of my first students. Um, he's gone on to become a neuropathologist. He did an MD PhD at University of Minnesota. Um, Dirk Keen is his name. And we were, we were both football fans. And Dirk happened to be a Minnesota Vikings fan and I was a Chicago Bear fan. And we'd always get together and watch football together. Well, I, has since gone on and he's done neuropathology and I was at a meeting in Seattle. He's at the University of Washington now. So we started talking and we started talking about um, brain concussions and TBI and football and how it would change the game of football. And then we got into science because he's a neuropathologist. He's seen a lot of these pathologies and he had the idea and he knew that I worked on insects. He said, you should try giving fruit flies concussions. And I thought, that is a brilliant idea because we can do so many things with insects, especially Drosophila. So let me pull a Drosophila up for you. So here's a vial of fruit flies and you can see them flying around in there. They are about, these are big animals. This is a Carolina um, um, 
subspecies of Drosophila melanogaster, and they're, they're quite big. Um, so we were puzzled, how do you give a fruit fly a concussion? And we work on this for quite a while. We, we stuck them with a pin and that was kind of invasive. So um, we struggled with this quite a bit, but I was interested in, okay, so why do this? I mean, we can give a fruit fly a concussion, I'm sure, but why? Well, I wanted to study learning and memory. And so what we, we, we actually stole this idea from another paper from a group from the University of Wisconsin. And let me see if I can give you a better perspective here. I've got this all, here we go. So what we do is we have a vial of flies, right? Just like that, and there's no flies in here, but we attach it to the spring-loaded device. And if you look in the background, <clears throat> there are different angles. So this is a 30 degree angle. So if we want a minor TBI, we slap it there. And if we want to go with a little bit more force, we hold it at 45 degrees. And if we really want to go with a strong whack, we hold it at 90 degrees. And the little rubber pad here keeps it from vibrating too long. And so we can control the number of hits that we do and we control the intensity of those. So then what did we do? We, we put them in a Y maze and asked, do they go to an arm that has an odor in it, or do they go to an airstream? And most of those animals would go to the airstream arm. They found the odor was not um, attractive at all. But then we trained them to go to the odor arm by putting the odor in a vial with sugar water. And then we'd move it over to a vial with just plain water and air. And after five trials, we put them back in the Y maze and all of those animals would go to the odor arm. And this is classical conditioning, uh, Pavlov's dog. I mean, you, you all know that experiment. But if we concuss those flies, if we put them on the TVI wacometer, um, what happened was they did not learn. So um, that's fascinating. We've taken that and, and people are interested in it. Um, but what we are now doing is what we have to show is that there's a morphological correlate. Another group, um, the, the group from Wisconsin, has shown that there's a um, gut dysbiosis, that the gut tears. And they think that this is the problem with learning and memory. So what we're doing right now is we're, we're sectioning um, Drosophila brains to look for neuronal injury, much in the same way that my past student Dirk Keen would do. And so we're looking for the size of the vacuoles and the number of vacuoles and asking, is there a correlation with the severity of injury? And I think we want to prove that this is in fact a valid model of neuronal injury and it has behavioral consequences. But in the end, what I'm really interested in is recovery. Because I think what we can do, and Drosophila are quite long lived animals. They will live up to 120 days. So what we hope to do is injure them early in their life look to see a learning deficit, and then ask 30 days, 60 days, 90 days later, do they recover? And do they recover their learning and memory? And what are the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for that? And we'd be keying in on one particular group of cells, astrocytes, that seem to do a lot of neuronal injury um, responses and repair. We think there's a similar mechanism going on in fruit flies, but we now have the ability to change any gene in fruit flies. So that's why we um, that's why we focus on fruit flies is that they are so useful. We don't have to rely on CRISPR to knock out a gene or introduce a gene. We can do this um, kind of on our own. Um, it, it, it doesn't take a lot. So there's a lot of utility in working with insects and things like that. The other project I have, I work on honeybee propolis. So all the same kind of thing, starting with behavior and diving into molecular mechanisms. I would say that this forms, informs my teaching. I'm fascinated by any aspect of um, animal behavior. And we can always relate that back to a neuronal mechanism, a biochemical mechanism, a molecular mechanism. And this is what I'm trying to teach intro students. And then we dive into the details uh, of this in cellular neurobiology. So a deeper dive. And then what I really hope to do in cellular neurobiology 
is get students to propose the, their own experiments. And that's exactly, we're in the last third of the semester here. And so every student is writing a grant and they have to defend it to the class. And we go through a, uh, an evaluation of, of peer review. So everybody gets to read really good grants and really bad grants and everybody's writing improves through this process. So the goal of our biology department, I would say the goal of Hamilton College is to teach you the fundamentals, dive into the details, and then allow you to explore your interests. And I, we do that across the boards from intro classes all over. And then every student at Hamilton College is required to do a senior thesis. And I mean, there is that word required. You should look at that as an opportunity. And we have this open curriculum. You can take any class that you want, but what we really hope that you would do is follow that interest yours and take a deep dive into the subject that really fascinates you. And I think that is really the secret to Hamilton College is that we have provided an opportunity to do that in any field you choose. I've given you an example of my world, but if you went and talked to an economist or a social scientist or a <clears throat> psychologist, they would take you on the same journey that I've just given you. The tools are different, the questions are different, but the idea is to dig into those details. Um, so I just happened to glance at Connor's question. Out of curiosity, how do you deflect the fly brains when they're so small? Very carefully um, with a microscope. But Connor, what I would say is that if you wanna be a brain surgeon, try practicing on fruit flies first. And frankly, that will be the finest surgery you ever do with your own hands. So um, you can, uh, uh, students in, the, in my lab dissect out fruit fly brains all the time, okay? So you're welcome to come and give it a try. Um, I, I don't know if I went too fast, too slow, or just right, but um, Beaches, I'll let you take over and guide us through the next part of this. Herb, that was awesome. Like I, again, I was very curious as to, you know, when we talked about this during, during one of our junior events, you had talked about concussing fruit flies. And I was, I was like, every day I was thinking about that, like, how do you actually do that? And so I'm so glad to actually see that the instruments and it seems very homegrown. Like this is something oh, yeah. you all kind of design. <laughs> and, and can you please correct me if, if I'm wrong, that this is a first year class doing this, or is this so um, it can students. be. Okay. So I actually, my first year class, we go out in the field and we just identify an insect. And so we don't right. bring them in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, but as first year students, we are dissecting behaviors and understanding their neuronal um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I invite anybody to come into the lab. Um, I have a typical load for me is I have six seniors. And mm -hmm. so they're all working on their... They should be in the lab right now, to be honest. <laughs> the weather's too nice, that's why. <laughs> They're outside. <laughs> but, um, and the way I organize it is if you're interested in coming into the lab, and it would be hard to field everybody on this list, mm -hmm. but I would team you up with a senior. And the senior always needs help. We've got a big team working on the, um, the neuroanatomy of our concussed flies. We also have a big group working on that TBR project and trying to pinpoint that to hypoxic zones. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we have people working on honeybees. We also have, no one's working on the vitamin C project. That's kind of a, a pet project to me, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure someone will pick that up very soon. Mm -hmm. So how has the, you know, one of the questions that I have for you, Harm, is how is that how has this lab component that experience changed as a result of COVID? You know, how, what type of adjustments have you made? Have you had to make many adjustments um, because of the fact that we have some students who may be studying remotely and may not be, you know, they could definitely go outside their, their homes and possibly grab a bug that way. But how do they, you know, how are they able to conduct their, the research if they're. Yeah. Um, so you take advantage of the resources available to you and mm -hmm. So for example, last year I had a student that was interested, but partially remote. Mm -hmm. And so we, we came up with a project. And as Peach has mentioned, I'm also very interested in public health. Mm -hmm. um, I, teach a, also, I also teach a course that really started off as a public health course, um, but now has evolved into health systems. So it, it's much broader than just simply public health. 
we talk about health systems, hospitals, doctors, insurance groups, um, big pharma, medical devices. Then we talk about public health and then we talk about community foundations. I want a glimpse of what the entire healthcare in infrastructure is. And so COVID was breaking out last fall and Hamilton has gone on to do quite a bit of work in trying to control COVID on campus. In fact, they've done an amazing job of this. So we are really interested in studying that. Right. And so that particular student's thesis has been to look at practices at small colleges in central New York and asking the question, what works and what doesn't? And um, actually it's quite interesting what she found. Mm -hmm. And it was the social contract that seemed to make the biggest difference. That is students signing up to be a part of this. And we basically had a social contract where students would agree to support the college's initiative. Mm -hmm. And that turned out to be rather rare. And we have across all the other schools that we've looked at, we have a um, actually remarkably low COVID uh, mm -hmm. positive rate here. So you make do with what you've got is what I would say. Um, another question that we, we have in the Q&A, um, which, was, which was great to hear is this, um, you were talking about the, the presentation of, of grant writing. So you, you have the students present grants and you, they read each other's and, and it's a really great intersection of you know, the strong communication skills we want students to develop while they're in Hamilton, but also in, in, a, in a particular field that they're completely passionate about. And so um, is, does that hope happen mostly in the senior year as well? Or is this, do students build up to this? As, or is it a, a separate class? Um, it, it all is part of our senior project. Mm -hmm. So we have programming around our first semester for seniors. And um, for the most part, most biology students are um, two semester thesis students. So they come in in the first semester and usually develop the tools that they will use. And the second semester is when the data collection really starts to roll in. Mm -hmm. All along, they have to present their study um, very beginning of the uh, fall semester. So just articulate what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. And then they give a summary of their results at the end of the fall semester. And that will conclude with a, a summary of the, um, the project itself at the end of classes. Mm -hmm. So when does that start? It starts freshman year. So the students that are are in our classes are during oral presentations. So they will find a study. This is not one of their own design. We, we, basically, we have to teach them, we have to teach everybody, even ourselves, on how to read the scientific literature. What is it like to read a science journal rather than read the New York Times that's a summary of a science journal? Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's tricks and tools of to the trade that you learn. For example, you don't really need to learn the, to read the materials and methods in, unless you're gonna reproduce the experiment but really start with the introduction, then go directly to the results and, and ask the question, what do these results mean? And, and that has such bearing on what we're doing now. Um, there was a commissioned um, report from the WHO to look into the origins of COVID-19. And they went to Wuhan and they started to look at, is this vital, the idea that, um, bats could transmit COVID-19 to humans. And what was interesting about that report, I haven't looked at it, but I have seen a couple of summaries, so I haven't read the report yet. But one of the things that was striking to a reviewer was that there was very little data presented in this um, study. So that perked my eyes up is, so why not? What kind of data would you be looking for? And so, I think that's what science reading tells you is that we want to be informed by the data and it has such practical applications today. Mm -hmm. um, so a question that we have, um, and, and thanks to the students for submitting your questions via the Q&A, but also when you registered. Um, a number of my colleagues are actually also online answering questions and definitely if they're ones that are for you, Herm, I want to ask you as well. Um, so part of the Hamilton Promise is that we get to, we tell students that they get to study what they love and that is very much tied to the open curriculum. Um, for, for many students, they, they haven't really discovered what they loved yet. And so how do you explain 
the open curriculum to students and how do you um, encourage them to take advantage of that? Because sometimes this lack of structure in the sense of divisional or core requirements is sometimes scary to students when they've been in high school and they've had, you know, they've been required to take these particular classes. How do you encourage them to really truly dive into the open curriculum? The way that starts is with your first year advisor. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is we try to team up um, a professor that you would have in one of your first classes. At, so in the fall semester, and we want that person to be your advisor. And it, it's a bit of a, um, well, you get to submit a list of the courses that you would like to take at Hamilton College. And the registrar will go through that list and try to give you your first, in some cases, your second choice. Mm -hmm. But then after, we're going to start distributing students to the classes that we, we hope that you get all the classes that you like, but sometimes that's not always the case. Maybe your third and fourth choices are something a little bit related to what you might have put down on that list. Mm -hmm. We try our best to get into those 10 courses, but that's when the advisor comes in. And so you'll meet with me, for example, um, in your first couple of weeks and okay, how's it going? How are the classes? And you can go through drop ad um, mm -hmm. in the first week. That's a little tight for a first year student. And I yeah. would encourage you not to drop an ad but that's when the conversation starts is, okay, but really the goal here is to sample our curriculum. You don't wanna come in and take all biology courses. In fact, we would have failed our job if you started here and just took biology and we want you to start to see the ties. And, it, and I, I go back to what I was teaching and my motivation for teaching the public health course, because there was a group of us that really wanted to draw students into the classes other than the biology and the chemistry and the physics students. I wanted to talk to the government students. I wanted to talk to someone that has some expertise in economics and public policy and sociology, and psychology and, and, and philosophy. Those are the kinds of conversations I wanna have around a scientific discipline. And, and it's so plentiful. Um, so I started teaching public health class and that has turned into what I would say has been a career changing um, direction for me. It got me, the reason I became a contact tracer is that the Oneida County Public Health Director has been to my class for every year for the last six years. And um, Phyllis Ellis has been wonderful in sharing her expertise. Um, the last infectious break that we had on campus was a norovirus. We were at the county public health department when those results were communicated to the county health director um, from Albany that we had a norovirus infection. So that was sort of real time investigative work. And now all of a sudden, okay, we go from this diagnosis, how do we roll that out? So in a lot of ways, what we did was we kind of, we kind of could see what was going to happen with COVID-19 with a much more infectious, much, much less controllable um, virus that it was not as easily detected. We, we fought back norovirus very quickly. And mm -hmm. when you are in this situation of a crisis, um, I would say there's, there's no better place to be than Hamilton College. We have put so many resources into COVID-19 even norovirus. My favorite example of the norovirus was our, our safety director uh, mm -hmm. in charge of environmental safety, Brian Hansen. And Brian Hansen realized that we have a norovirus contamination. Norovirus can exist on hard surfaces for, um, for quite a long time, several days. So the, the idea was to clean every hard surface on campus. So he ordered thousands of cases of OxyClean, um, and got this all in within two days and was reading the fine label and it was not certified to clean norovirus. Mm -hmm. They sent the wrong material. How many of us would have read that label that carefully and said, you have to take this all back. We need something that's certified for norovirus C line two in my order. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, Hamilton does things well, and that was my introduction to public health. I'm mm -hmm. delighted. I'm trying to fiddle with light here. Um, so 
I, that's how I got to become a contact tracer is I felt I owed it back to Phyllis to help her out because they were in a pickle. When mm -hmm. this happened a year ago, and when I walked into the county health department, every COVID positive record was in a manila envelope and all the close contacts were in there. And it was my job to contact the first, they gave me the low job of just contacting the, co the, the contacts. Mm -hmm. But then I got to make the inquiries into the, um, the positives and do the positive uh, interviews as well. And that was all done by brute force, uh, mm -hmm. just people calling people. Mm -hmm. And what, what a wonderful way to get to know Utica, New York. Mm -hmm. um, people think we live out in Sorry about that. Um, if you could hold, we are going to try to get Professor Lehman back. Thank you so much for your patience. And we will make sure that we get to more questions as well. Um, while we wait for Professor Lehman to get back, I'm more than happy to answer questions um, for you all. I wish I could answer them to the level that he can in regards to his, the stories that he's been showing uh, and, expl and you know, expressing to us about the work that he's done, not only for the college, but also for our community. Um, I can tell you from firsthand, um, the work that he's contributed as a member of our task force has um, been pretty amazing that we've been a school that has, uh, has had very few positive cases and when there is a situation, there is an automatic communication with the rest of the campus about, um, you know, maintaining our, our what they call the, the Hubble, which is the Hamilton bubble, but also making sure that students are being safe and then they're getting their needs met um, and that faculty and staff are being supported as well. So, um, but definitely, I appreciate your patience during this. Um, and I'm certain he's probably wondering what is going on right now. Um, but uh, definitely, I think, you know, more than, as I said, I'm more than happy to answer your questions if anyone has any. I will say that for, um, I, if you were just as fascinated with, um, with the props, the, the fruit flies and the caterpillars, I, I, there was a student who noted if it was real. Um, and so I was actually wondering the same thing. So thank you very much for asking that question um, because I was curious as well. But um, I think the thing is hopefully, you know, what Professor Lehman has shown you during this time is the level of engagement that our faculty have with students. And this is not an anomaly. He is not um, someone, you know, he is not someone that we is, um, this is a common story for a lot of our faculty members that they are truly invested in the education of our students. And so the level, um, definitely focusing on research and advising, um, you know, these are the things that our faculty are truly engaged with. Um, I also think the fact that we are an undergraduate college, so the focus is on undergraduate education um, is something that's always, um, you know, something that definitely stands out as well. So you're back. Great. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it, it was totally fine. It was, it was one of those things that I was, you know, I was, I was like, wait, did I freeze? And my colleague said, he's frozen, but you're still talking. And, and fortunately, everyone in, who's been viewing has been so great um, in, in regards to just, you know, waiting until you joined us. Um, they're actually saying that, you know, um, the work that you're doing makes her um, students feel safe about going into campus this fall. So the oh. work that you do is just, is amazing. Um, you know, one of the questions definitely, maybe Herm, you can actually talk about this. You know, I know that the COVID task force 
is still in the process of deciding what will happen this fall. But, you know, we were fortunate to bring over 90% of students on campus this fall. So the plan is to, if, if everything continues to stay the same and improves, then we should, you know, we, we should have a more normal year, right? We are so <laughs> hoping so. Um, and, and we let data be our guide. And we're constantly watching the numbers here on campus, the numbers in Oneida County, the numbers at the state and vaccination rates. Um, and everything looks extraordinarily promising right now. And I mean, the, the push now is to try to get all students vaccinated before they leave. Um, that would be wonderful. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, you know, we are bound by New York State uh, rules and guidelines, um, but you can start to see the value of that because we we live in a protected environment here. Um, but that's not always the case at a small college or a large college, and so we don't want we as a collective health department or, or health society don't want to release a bunch of students that might get infected on their way home, for example. Right. So I th we're certainly moving in the right direction. Um, if I, I know that everybody on that task force wants to open in as normal of a condition as we possibly can in the fall. And, and so that's the goal. And But we're not afraid to do what we have to do to open under any circumstance. Great. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the open curriculum. Um, have you ever had a situation where um, you had a student entering your class who did not have an initial interest in biology, you know, had, you know, maybe taken the recommendation from a friend and then became a complete convert? We're like, you know, they were completely amazed by the department and just realized, wow, I never, you know, I, maybe I didn't have a positive biology experience in high school and like, this is biology in college, this is amazing. Have you ever had those types of experiences? I think it's happening more frequently now mm -hmm. than it did before. Um, and, and so what I mean by that is that we've changed our intro curriculum considerably over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and up until three years or four years ago, we taught an intro bio class to the masses. Um, we had intro bio that was shared between four faculty members, two faculty members in the spring, two faculty members in the fall, and we would tr try to teach the breadth of biology. And, and we've tossed that model out. The problem is there were 60, 70 students in the classroom and, you know, the labs we would have as, as maybe as few as 20 to 25, but still, um, you never got to know students very well. It, it was a it was sort of antithetical to what I would say the goal of Hamilton College was. So we've transformed that into a um, small enrollment. So now less than 30, I think the cap is 28 students. Mm -hmm. And we all teach something that interests us. So for example, I teach a behavior and neuroscience class. Mike McCormick, uh, this is the class I would take is microbes rule. Um, I, I just think that understanding microbes and how they start to interact with you know, human systems is a wave of the future. And we just don't fully understand that yet. Um, Pat Reynolds teaches my passion, our blue ocean, um, genes and genomes. And I mean, so every topic imaginable. So I think what happens in that class is that you come in thinking you wanna be a doctor or you know, a lawyer, and then you take a class and you discover that you know, I never realized an insect would be so interesting. And, and maybe that triggers the thought, and I'm not gonna say that everybody's gonna be an entomologist here, but you might discover something about nutrition, for example, and how that, how understanding two different worlds starts to make sense to you. You can compare a vertebrate digestive system and an insect digestive system, realize that they're dramatically different. What's amazing in an insect, the pH is pH 12 in the inside of a gut. Yours is pH 2. How is it they can do the same thing with such grammatically different pHs? It's fascinating. And so then you're off into, okay, understanding digestive uh, transport, for example. So I think that's what happens in the biology. Um, and I would say, you know, students that have come in, I, 
I can think of a couple of examples where students came in um, as history majors, one, one particular student, um, but became, and actually she was the person that really drove the, the TBI experiments. She was the one that really developed the learning and memory uh, paradigm. Um, so I always remember sort of kidding her is that she, you know, wasn't ever going to be a biologist, but she's now working on her PhD. So, you know, I, I wish that I could say that I was, you know, I was responsible for that, but I think I just, I give them the information and let the students run with it. And, and it's, it's digging into those details. It, it's finding something that you're really passionate about. I understand that we have an open curriculum and, and that you can explore a lot of opportunities, but I, I think that really our goal is to let you focus in an area that you really find interesting and you have the opportunity to sample a lot of the, a lot of different disciplines while you're here mm -hmm. and actually that's a that's a great question to my follow-up is that do you have students who are possibly um you know we double majoring in biology and maybe a non-stem related course um it seems like from what you were saying from some of the examples like crossing over into public health and you know, having these conversations with people in philosophy and economics, that's what you know has been exciting for you to talk to students in those disciplines. But do you see them doing double majors in, in those types of disciplines? On the rare occasion, we do see double majors. Double majors gets a little bit complicated because we have the senior thesis requirement or senior project requirement. So that means if you're gonna major in biology and chemistry, you'd have to do two senior projects. Why not just major in biochemistry? So, you know, doing those double majors in the science is probably not a great example, but I mean, we do have an awful lot of students that get minors. And I think it, it, what I hear from students is, well, I took two, I really like history, and I don't know why I'm picking on history. Um, I have two students, the advisees, first year advisees that are, are historians and, and want to study that. So maybe that's the reason. But and I took a third out of curiosity. Now all I need is two more history classes and I get a minor. So why not? And, and sure, absolutely, why not? And there's plenty of room in the curriculum to do that. Um, yeah, so lots and lots of examples. And you can start to see the thread. One of the reasons that I was always interested in philosophy. Why? Because logical argument. And that's where I discovered the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And it made sense to me, hypothesis testing, um, when I took a philosophy class. So mm -hmm. we, we feed on each other so, so much. Sometimes it's not so apparent. You have to look, kind of look in the weeds to discover that. But that's part of the, the treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and I have a couple more questions for you. Um, so can you actually talk a little bit about the, the advising system? You did talk about, you know, for, especially for a first year, having your um, first year advisor. Um, we do have now the Alex program um, that is going to be implemented for this particular class. The class of 2025 will be the first class doing it. But how do, how does the, how do, how do faculty approach advising in general for students? So I, I missed that last part. How do faculty approach advising, oh. you know? Yeah, so I love advising. One, um, because it's not, all, I, I don't have just biology advisees. And so it's my way of learning about our curriculum. Um, and you truly learn about everybody's curriculum when you have to advise a historian and figure out, okay, what does it take to major in history? And so, the idea is to put you in front of an advisor that is in your discipline, but that isn't always the case, but you'll find that every advisor is willing to go the extra mile and find out the information that you need. You will meet with your advisor before you register for classes. So we are about to start advising for the fall semester. And so I will meet with every one of my advisees um, and this year will probably be on Zoom, but not necessarily. Um, we're not allowed to meet in offices because the space is too small and we can't distance by six feet. But you know, we'll we'll take a walk outside. We'll always talk about um, okay, what are the classes? Which ones are going well? Which ones are bad? Um, not that they're always bad, but you know, you want to be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. Um, everything's wonderful. I really like this. And then we get the students to start thinking about, okay, well, what does it look like for next semester? What, what are you interested in? 
And very quickly, you'll learn that a first year advisee is going to ask you, well, what are you thinking about in terms of a major? Because in some cases, it makes a big difference. If, if one of the more difficult things to do here is pre-med, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of classes required for that. Right. And so, you know, you have to fit in, if you want to do all the courses required for you, you certainly can do that. But you need to be thinking ahead, especially if you want to study abroad, for example. So that's the kind of information I want. Um, maybe not first time we meet, but what are you thinking about? Let's get you into a class that gets you into that field and, and let you feel it out. And sometimes people walk away and say, oh, that was great. Or sometimes, yeah, that wasn't for me. Either answer is perfect because if it's something that interests you, let's, okay, let's continue. If it's something that really that didn't work, okay, let's try a different door. Let's go through uh, a, a different avenue. What's, what's next? Mm -hmm. But we do want to start thinking ahead. Um, most students will study abroad junior year. Um, so we want to plan for that. And you want to be thinking about senior project. And yeah, pushing it first year, that may be a little bit much. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to start, start thinking. So after the end of your first year, I would expect that you can probably that I will be asking all of my students here in a week to sketch out what the next three years looks like. And so, you know, plan, it, it's not binding, but mm -hmm. it gives you a sense of, okay, we've planned, we've thought about it, we've looked at classes. Um, this looks like a good plan. I've got something to go by. It's not a semester by semester decision. We want long-term planning to fit with your goals and your aspirations to fit with what we offer here, which is as, as rich and diverse as, as you can possibly imagine. Right. So as we think about that, um, you know, how would you how would you talk to those students who, you know, do you have a piece of advice those, for those students who are still making their decisions? You know, they they're being notified about what colleges they were admitting, you know, they've been admitted to. What piece of advice would you give them as they make that decision? Oh gosh, that is that's the hardest, <laughs> that's the hardest question ever. <laughs> because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will say, and I've been through it as a faculty member here. Um, my daughter is a junior. She, she, I could not convince her to go to Hamilton College. <laughs> um, and we went and looked at a lot of schools, as did my son. I have an older son that's now graduated from college. He didn't go here either. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. You just know. You just know the right spot. And, and it's just, it, it's that feeling that this feels right to me. And I can't explain it, but I think the idea is to do exactly what you guys are doing, is to join on this and, and find something that resonates with you. And maybe what you'll do, oh, heaven forbid you look at my website because it's terribly outdated, but look at somebody else's just in a, in a subject area. And so don't choose a subject area, find out what the faculty are interested in in that subject area. Do, boy, that's kind of interesting. The person I would go work with, and I've talked about history a lot, is Morris Isterman. I would love to walk in his shoes as a um, an author of Mountain Exploration. I just think that would be wonderful. I'm fascinated with the Mount, 10 Mountain Division. So that's the kind of relationship you can get here. So don't, don't choose a subject. Choose a, a person. Um, who is it you want to work with? Who is it that interests you the most? And I can't say that, you know, every student, heaven forbid, every student would want to work with me. And, okay, I, I have my gruff spots, but um, it, it's, that's the kind of thing you want. You want to be able to come into a class and, you know, have that connection. Um, and, and I think that's kind of what decides where you go is, is do you have that connection? to the place, to the subject, to the people here, um, that all that's all part of it. So hopefully this will be an easier question. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was a great answer. I mean, definitely, you know, the idea of, you know, we always want to look for fit and like, where can you see yourselves growing? Where do you see yourself with, when the resources are available for you, how can you have a transformational experience? Mm -hmm. um, so the other question is, for those who've already decided on do you have any advice for them? How does they should spend, spend their summer and prepare for college? Um, 
I would have, uh, you asked this question, this was, this was, this was equally hard. <laughs> um, you know, I think what I would do is, is I would dive into the things that interest me. And, you know, maybe, maybe let's take an example that you're interested in biology. And is there a book that I would read just to, to tweak my interest? Um, and, and that's what I would look for. Um, let me see if I... <laughs> I love the props, Herm. I love the props. I did not. I did not think of this. This is a fabulous yeah. book. I read that book. Um, awesome. It is um, the Emperor of All Maladies, written by Siddhartha Maharshi. Um, I, I was one of the very fortunate ones. Um, I invited Dr. Maharshi to campus, and he came to campus. Um, oh, probably eight or nine years ago, and. Here's a story of a kid that grew up in India and honestly lived a relatively privileged life in India, went to Stanford University. And he, um, well, he was at Stanford as a first year student joined a lab, just picked one. Worked in the laboratory of Paul Berg. Two years later, Paul Berg won the Nobel Prize. That catapulted Sid to um, as a Rhodes Scholar and went to Oxford University and got his DPhil, his doctorate in philosophy in immunology. He then went to Harvard Medical School and um, concentrated in oncology and um, has now a practice in New York City. And while he was a resident, so you know the story about residents, right? So residents are these people that are working nonstop, 24 hours a day. He wrote this book and it won a Pulitzer Prize. And so my, so my question to him, and we honestly um, had a cup of coffee after his talk. And I said, how did you do that? You know, you're working 12 hours. He's, and his answer was so simple, was if I had five minutes, I would write. And I just thought, that's so cool. So I tried it. It's impossible. <laughs> but I mean, that's what it takes to work at this kind of level. So he wrote this book and it's a historical account of cancer. It talks about the very first cancer patients and, and then comes up. And, and so this is a, I love this book, and, and, but it, it's my particular area that I just liked because it was something that I have a little bit of knowledge in, but I learned so much more. I use it in my lectures now. I've used this guide for a lot of different conversations I have. So that's the thing I would do is I would find something that, you know, might be interesting, but might be daunting. I like to read big books in the summertime because I have lots of time and can turn pages slowly. So use something just to pursue your interest. And, you know, it really doesn't matter much, but it gives you sort of insight as to, okay, well, now I'm going to take a cellular molecular course. I read this Maherky book. I want to learn about what is RAS? What does RAS have to do with cancer? Because that was the first gene that we thought was caused by an infectious agent that caused cancer. So we, for a long time, we thought cancer was some infectious agent, but we now know better. Anyway. That's my answer to that question. Okay, so I have a lightning round of questions. Okay. So, favorite building on campus? Science Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite place to eat on campus? Um, I would say Opus One. Um, there are two Opuses. They're, they're small dining, but the ambiance of Opus One is just terrific. And I like to get over to the other side of campus when I can. And uh, I just, I, I like that little cafe. <laughs> Favorite Hamilton research product project? Um, my TBHR project, the, the one with hypoxia. Mm -hmm. That's that's my baby. It, it really is an interesting combination of molecular biology, cell biology. And we, we that's homegrown. We, we found this protein. Um, no one yet knows what it does. Interesting story there. I had a 
I had a seminar speaker come in who was invited by a student that was here at Hamilton. I, my dad wants to give this talk. And so I was describing the TA, TBHR project. He was working on the vertebrate analog of that in humans. And we had a, a lot of exchanges. He still doesn't know what it does, but it's it, interestingly, it's upregulated in highly achieving elderly patients. So I think it has to do with hypoxia resistance. The, you know, as you get older, your circulation starts to decline. Those systems that are built up to survive hypoxia live longer and are higher performing. And, and so that's my simplistic explanation of that. So, yep, anyway. One word to describe Hamilton students. First class, top to bottom. Yeah, uh, it's, it's delightful to get to know students here. And everybody has a story. Everybody has a different story. And then one word to describe Hamilton. Oh, I can't do it in one word. I'm gonna say several. What I would say is Hamilton is a wonderful place to come to school. It's even a better place to work. Thank you so much, Herm. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining oh, us tonight. I loved this conversation. I, I am, I'm going to try to sit in on the class. I would love to sit in on one of your classes, Herm. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. Because, yeah. But definitely, and um, thank you for your attention, you guys. Sure. Um, and great questions. Sorry we didn't, I assume Nathan <laughs> Cameron got to these, but okay. if not, I'll see you in the fall. Absolutely. And what we're going to do, Herm, is we're going to actually have this, um, there will be a recording of this. And so we'll, we will make it for, available for everyone who came, but also for those who weren't, didn't have a time, um, didn't have the opportunity to join us this evening. But okay. definitely, thank you so much um, for joining us. Congratulations again. Have a great day. Have a great night. Have a great morning, wherever you're Zooming from. And thanks so much again. Take care. Very good. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.